Welcome to High Lawn Baptist Church in St. Albans, West Virginia, where our mission is to know Christ and to make Christ known. We pray that you are blessed by the sharing of God's truth for us this day. For more information, visit us online at highlawnbaptistchurch.org. Go ahead and take out your copy of God's Word. And turn to the epistle of 1 Peter. 1 Peter, chapter 5. If it can be said that there's one weakness that dwells within the human heart, one of the enemies, one that the enemies of the devil, the world, and the flesh can take advantage of, it's pride. Pride is the foundation of all other sins. It's the overfocus on the self at the expense of God. In more spiritual terms, pride is the desire, the temptation to take God off the throne of our hearts and to place ourselves on the throne instead, to be God in our own eyes. Up until this point in this sermon series, we've talked about the, um, the promises of God to the individual believer. Right now, we're, we are continuing with that. But one of the things that I want to, to get across in today's message is what can block it. If you think of us as a, as a basket or as a, 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 a jar ready and open, ready to re receive and be filled with the blessings of God, pride is one of those things that can cover that jar over, that can cause the blessings to pour away. This is actually an old rabbi's image. And within the heart of the believer, one of the things, that the blessings that we're going to see in just a second that God has both commandment and promise to cover us with, to equip us with, to provide for us with, blessings reserved for those who are humble-hearted. In fact, those, that should be a qualification for every believer. The acknowledgement that we are totally reliant on God, that we cannot work ourselves into salvation, that we cannot provide for ourselves, that... Um, that we have a need, that we not, are not all complete within ourselves, but that we need the love, the kindness, the forgiveness, and the embrace of our Creator. For unbelievers, pride blocks their hearts from recognizing the convicting grace of God. For believers, it strains our relationship between ourselves and God, as well as each other. In an affront with the great commandments to love God with everything that we are, to love our neighbors as ourselves, and to love each other just as Christ loves us, it also reduces the blessings of God in our lives because it causes us to rob ourselves of the depth of the relationship that we're created and redeemed to have with our Creator. Part of the anxiousness that we see in our world today is that for many of us, we're being confronted with the fact that the world's not the way that we want it to be. We become so fixated on the wants that we, can't, that we can't satisfy. We become blinded by the blessings that are right there in front of us. Or we become so focused on the problems before us that we take our eyes off of the one who is the solution. The agape love of God, the same love that He empowers all of us who are His children with to demonstrate, to, to be an example of, that same love that fills our hearts maintains a close and intimate relationship with Him because it maintains our focus on God, our reliance on God, and it compels us into service to God and to those who are made in His image. Write that down in your notes. The agape love of God, the humility that we need to have in our hearts. Before we can be filled with the agape love, we have to have a humble heart that's a heart free of pride. Humility cleanses the heart. It opens it up so that we can receive the blessings of agape love. What is agape love? It is self-sacrificing love. It is the love characterized by Jesus Christ. It is the love of God that we are called not only to be filled with, but to exhibit in front of others. 
a heart that is in that kind of state, one that has been freed of the burdens of pride and the weakness of pride by humility, and then filled with that agape love, maintains its focus on God, its reliance on God, and it compels us to service for God and for those who are created in His image. 1 Peter chapter 5, starting with verse 5. Once you get there in your copy of God's Word, say Amen. Second half of verse 5. All of you clothe yourselves with what? Humility toward one another because God resists the proud and gives grace to who? To the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that He may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on Him because He cares for you, being totally reliant on His strength, His wisdom, not of your own. Don't try to climb the mountain by yourself. Let God carry you. Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. What is the chink in their armor that he uses to latch his claws into? Pride. Resist him. Be firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering that is being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world, the, great, the God of grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. To him be dominion forever. And all God's people said, may God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. What we are being told by the Apostle Peter is to let your hearts be free of that which the enemy can latch on to. Like a lion diving in with claws. All it takes is a little bit of pride. All it takes is a focus off of God and onto ourselves. And he has us. Humility is a shield. Humility covers us, keeps us filled with the blessings of God, and gives us the ability to be open and receptive to those blessings. Now, before we go any further, let me clarify that what we're talking about is not a magic formula for getting whatever you want out of God. It's a study in following along with those heroes of the faith like Peter and like Paul, who also teach us that one of the blessings of a humble heart is that through that intimacy of God that it helps to foster, we can learn to be content in all circumstances, that no matter the persecution that we face, no matter the unreability, in times of want, in times of need, in times of disaster, in times of guilt. Paul was starving in a Roman prison. The Philippian church brought food for him, among other gifts. And as he's writing back a large thank you letter that we have, and we're going to talk about in just a second, he says, I have learned to be content in all life's circumstances. That's the peace of God at work within a humble heart. That's the value of it. A peace that we can't work for, that we can't earn, that we can't develop a strategy for. We are totally reliant for God to cover us with His peace. And the blessing from that is that God's peace is something that He grants freely to those trusting in Him and not in the economics, not in the politics, not in the power of the structures of this world. Peace comes from knowing God and His ways, not knowing and becoming embroiled in the ways of the world. And thinking that we can navigate this world without God is a recipe for disaster. Pride blocks us from the blessings of God because it forces us to assume responsibility for our own provision, for our life circumstances, and for our own sense of security. We think of these things, when we think of these things as the work of our own strength and our own intellect, and as a result, we, we, we heap mountains of anxiety on ourselves because we're trying to do what only God can do. 
You have not because you ask not. Somebody wants to find anxiety is trying to take responsibility on yourself that's reserved for God. And I think that that's true. One of the things that we do that makes us anxious is that we try to assume our own responsibility and we forget to ask, we forget to pray. One of the things that we covered in, in the book of Numbers is that the children of Israel, instead of going to God in prayer, humbling themselves before the Lord, declaring their needs, instead walked up to Moses and said, why have you rescued us from Egypt only so we can die in the desert? Folks, God did not save us to be miserable. He did not bring us out of the wanderings in our own sin and give us salvation and a position in the kingdom Life everlasting so that we can spend it looking like we've been baptized in pickle juice. We are given and gifted with a peace that passes all understanding. Why? Because it's not me who is reliant upon my... my. I do not provide for myself. I need to be reliant on God for my provision. I am not responsible for my peace, but I know the God who is. Jason Robbins cannot navigate this world on his own and have any monicum of success. But if... If we, are relate, if we are reliant on God, fixed on Him as our north star, then He will carry us by. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understandings. In all of your way, acknowledge Him and what? He will direct your path. There is no better navigator than the God who created this world to begin with. Pride blocks us from a relationship with God because as we take our eyes off of what is eternal... We place them squarely on what is worldly. And as a result, we forget that God is right there. We ignore the divine presence. We ignore the impact that He has on our lives. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. I've just covered this, but highlight this in your copy of God's Word if you haven't already. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. In all of your ways, Know Him in this version, submit to Him and others, acknowledge Him, instill yet others. In all things, be reliant, be focused on, and submitted to His will for you, knowing that in that you have freedom. The freedom of the burdens of your own self. God will take care of it. He who has begun a good work within you, it is He who will bring it to completion. You don't have to worry about it. God does pray. Pride also blocks us from enjoying the benefits of our citizenship as part of God's kingdom. This is the aspect of pride we most often think of, an over-enthusiastic sense of self-worth. It's the delusion that worldly worldly comforts are all that matters. If someone is a substance abuser, an alcoholic, and is still able to function well enough so that their boss doesn't threaten them with their job, or their spouse doesn't threaten to leave them, or their health hasn't deteriorated, why in their own minds would they want to change? In their way of thinking, in that way of thinking, just good enough is good enough. Never mind the damage from the cover-ups, the irrational behavior, the financial drain, the relationship strain. Under that mindset, as long as the stress doesn't cause a mental breakdown, it's okay. Pride's the same way. Unfortunately, the well-known saying that you have, to reach rock spot, you have to reach rock bottom to make a change is all too often the truth. Only when a person sees the full extent of their brokenness and the pain that they've inflicted on others, the destitution, the suffering left in their wake, do they realize their need for help. As those who may be addicted to themselves, Sometimes we have to reach that critical level of conviction before we see our need for a Savior. Proverbs 26, 12. Do you see a person wise in their own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for them. This is the word of Solomon. The proud resist God, God's provision, God's sovereignty, God's forgiveness, because they see no need for help, no need for authority, no need for a Savior. That kind of arrogance hardens the heart so that it never confesses, never repents, never asks for forgiveness, sees no need for forgiveness. 
It not only prevents reconciliation with God, it also prevents reconciliation with those made in His image. How many marriages have collapsed beneath the weight of a fool's ego? How many apologies have gone unoffered because of a vain lack of humility? Someone incapable of saying two simple yet profound words, I'm sorry. How many friendships have ended because of simple arrogance? Pride comes with a dire cost. Don't pay it. The Apostle John warns us, 1 John 1, 8 and 9, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, then He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Just as God hates the sin of pride, God fully embraces the humble. Where pride always disintegrates into the anxiety of a person trying to work for their own success, humility offers a sense of peace, a strength, a certainty that comes from the fact that God assumes responsibility for our well-being. Where greed enslaves a person to the need for more and more material possessions, humility brings freedom, along with the understanding that the treasures of this life are worthless in the scope of eternity. Where guilt brings emotional paralysis over the past, humility brings conviction, a drive, an energy that propels a person from sin to service in the cause of salvation. Humility is fully capable of doing what pride refuses to do. A humble heart is quick to acknowledge the need for God's grace, ready to confess sin, willing to accept the guidance and provision of God. And he has a special place for the humble-hearted, as Jesus himself tells us in the Sermon on the Mountain, in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the what? The kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for what? They will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, or the meek, for they shall what? Inherit the earth. You cannot be poor in spirit without knowing your reliance on God. You cannot mourn without having a heart full of love for others. You cannot be meek without having empathy for those who suffer and a desire to end that suffering for them. And these, the Savior tells us, are the ones who will be rewarded for their humble hearts by inheriting the kingdom of God, the comfort of God, and the riches of the earth. This is the promise of God made through the voice of Christ Himself. And as representatives of the kingdom, a humble heart is requirement for the ministries that we're called into. Not just because of the closer connection to God that we get from it, but because without humility, ministry becomes self-centered instead of God-centered. A person who undertakes an expression of love with an agenda poisons their efforts because it becomes all about what I have done instead of what God has done. A ministry built on pride will only succeed in representing the fallen nature, the fallen person that we are without God's influence, flaws and all. But with a humble heart, our actions point to the love of God, the grace of God, the salvation of God. And we succeed in being the example of Christ's goodness before the lost, before our neighbors, and before our fellow believers. Empathy, compassion, service, gratitude, these are the virtues that all flow from a humble heart, and through them our fallen selves fade from view and the Savior's image becomes apparent. Colossians 3.23 Whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for who? For the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord you serve the Lord Christ. If you haven't highlighted this in your Bible, do so right now. This is a commandment with a promise. Whatever you do, whether at the time it's immediately for somebody or for an organization, whatever you do as a believer, acknowledge the fact that you are, re re excuse me, you are a representative of the Savior. So do it as you would for the Lord. Jesus will go on to teach that just as you have done this unto the least of these my brethren, 
Just as you have clothed the naked, just as you have fed the hungry, just as you have visited the prisoner, just as you have set the captive free, just as you have done any of these things unto the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you have also done it unto what? Unto me. This is a service for the Lord. Everything that you do, do with all your strength, all your conviction, and all your sense of morality because people are watching. And if you do it with that kind of a humble heart, the image of the fallen human being that we are forced to carry with us, that will fade from view. And the image of the risen Christ will be what that person sees. Evangelize always, and when necessary, use words. Let your conduct and your character be what causes conviction in someone else's lives. Be a demonstration of the love of God. The blessings of God's favor. Knowing that you live in the will of God and reflect the image of His Son are just the beginnings of the blessings that come to those who live humbly before Him. The kingdom of heaven, the comfort of God, and the kingdom of this world are promised inheritances to those who are open to the transforming power of a humble heart. For the sake of those living in the present, we can also turn to the testimony of the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4. Please follow me there in your copy of God's Word. Philippians 4, starting with verse 10. Now by this time in the Apostle's life, he's been imprisoned in Rome for spreading the news of the risen Christ and upsetting the pagan status quo. The Philippian church sends gifts to his comfort, to his hour of need, probably food and medicine, among other things. He had been a prisoner in Rome before, but now it's more, more severe because now, on top of the beatings, on top of, of the, the humiliation, he also has death quickly approaching. But while offering thanks to God for this church and their support, the apostle writes, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because once again you renewed your care for me. You were in fact concerned about me but lacked the opportunity to show it. He's just saying that you didn't have the opportunity to be here with me. I know, but I, I feel your love. I know your prayers. I don't say this out of need for I have learned to be what? Content in whatever, all things, in whatever circumstances I find myself, I have the peace of God on my side. That no government, no virus, no plague, no hunger, no famine, no anger, no frustration on the part of Nero, of Caesar himself, no sword can frighten me out of my peace because I have learned through Christ Jesus to be content in all situations. Hopefully we can learn from that example. I know how to make do with little. I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I am able to do all things through Him who gives me strength. From within a Roman dungeon, after being beaten, stoned, harassed, starved, slandered, threatened with death, Paul tells us that through his own sanctification journey, he has learned to be content under anything. Not only that, he reassures his fellow believers, both then and now, that the source of his strength is his total reliance on God and his total confidence in God. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. The God of Paul is the same God we serve today. The God who is the same today as He was yesterday and will be what? Forevermore. The same God provides for the comfort and peace for His children. That is a part of your inheritance that you have access to right now. The only qualification for that access is that we are willing and humble 
that we humble ourselves before God and stand in His presence fully reliant on His love and His grace for us. And through that humility comes the certainty of peace. Last thing I'll share with you right now from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 57, 15, the high and lofty one who lives in eternity, the Holy One of Israel says this, I live in high and holy place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those with repentant hearts. Faith is a gift that God gives us. The God that sees the past, the future, and the present all at the exact same time gives us this wonderful present. It's the way that we know that even though we can't see what is in front of us, that we know who's already there working it out. It is the contentment of heart that says in these present circumstances, nothing that happens to me in the here and now matters because I know who holds tomorrow. And not only that, I know who holds eternity. And not only that, I can rely on that beautiful promise that he who has started a good work in you, he who has begun a good work in you, he will draw it to completion. May the peace of God that passes all understanding dwell richly in your hearts. This was a lesson so central to the Christian message that on his last night with his closest friends, our Savior heard his disciples quibbling about who will be greatest in the kingdom. Who needs to sit on Christ's right? Who needs to sit on Christ's left? Who's going to be the greatest, the head apostle, the chief of the church? Who is going to be the great rabbi when they have earned their degree of, of Christness? And Jesus has gone off to, has left them with his ministry. Who is going to be the head at the table? Pointing to the stained glass window of the Last Supper. And Jesus, hearing this central message, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Seeing the need for one last lesson. He who is not only their rabbi, but their master. He is not only their master, but the prince of this universe takes off his robe, takes off his title of priest and master and rabbi, grabs a basin of water, wraps a towel around him, and begins to wash their feet, something that should have been done for them long before now. This is not just a, a quaint old expression of hospitality back in the time of the New Testament. This isn't just a, mat, a way to keep the home clean. This was a duty reserved for the least. This is what the slave of the household did. This is what the youngest child in a poor household did. This is what the least of all did. And the prince of this universe did it to show them one last powerful lesson, pivotal lesson of what the kingdom of God is like and what he expects of his children. John the Apostle, can you imagine John who is the youngest of all of them? This was what he should have done. And yet he sees his master performing his own duty. Can you imagine the humility that must have coursed through him at that moment in time? 
Jesus, uh, Peter actually rejected that. You are too high and exalted. You can't wash me. Unless I wash you, you have no what with me. You have no part with me. You have no place with me. And then he says what? Wash not only my feet, but all of me also. If you are to be a child of the king, the first lesson that any of us, all of us have to learn is to be humble before God, before each other, before all those made in his image. But with that humility comes the blessings of eternal life, eternal victory, and eternal peace. Hold that in your hearts. Let that reign supremely within you knowing that your work for the Lord is not in vain. And Heavenly Father, as we come before you now, as we prepare our hearts to receive the blessing of your table, remind us of what this time represents, that you who knew no sin became sin, so that in your sacrifice we might be seen by your Father as righteous in his eyes that you gave us his righteousness to wear, that we didn't deserve it. Forgive us for where we have not been the people you've called us to be, that you've saved us to be. Forgive us for joyful obedience. Free us from the burdens of this life. Free us from sin. Free us from pride. Free us from the anxiousness, from the temptation. Free us from all that would seek to enslave us. Grant us the joy that it is to be a part of your kingdom. Sons and daughters of the Most High God. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for joining us at High Lawn Baptist Church. We pray that you were blessed by today's message. We believe that when you love God, you share His Word, and when you love others, you spread the Gospel. We hope that you're planning on joining us next time and would love for you to join us in person. To learn more or to donate to our ongoing ministry, please visit us online at highlawnbaptistchurch.org. Once again, thank you, and may God bless you and keep you.